welcome everyone to Rule to the Throne, a discussion about nutrition for those who have colon surgery. Today's webinar is presented by the Hereditary Colon Cancer Foundation. I'm Shawnee Bray, and I know many of the names of the people who registered for this webinar. Um, Tracy, very happy to see that you're joining us today. They've been uh, longtime foundation members, and then also people who are new to our community and um, through a variety of methods, found out about this webinar, and I'm so glad you can join us as well. I am the uh, caregiver, founder, and development director for the Hereditary Colon Cancer Foundation. You'll hear a little bit about a little bit more about the caregiver part later this afternoon. If you are not a member of our community, just wanted to tell you how you can find us. Um, our website is hbcpicksteps.org, which is where you went to register for the webinar. Lots of resources out there for families affected by hereditary colon cancer syndrome, and you can also find us on social media channels. Today's webinar was sponsored by Myria Genetics. Um, you can find more information about them at myria.com. They are a genetic testing company, and um, they often sponsor some of the work that we do here at the foundation for both providers and for patients. And they also have a really neat tool called the Hereditary Cancer Quiz um, at that URL, hereditarycancerquiz.com, where if you have not been diagnosed with a hereditary cancer syndrome, but you do have a family history of multiple cancers, or you've been diagnosed with cancer under the age of 50, or you've had multiple cancers, um, you are certainly someone who is a candidate for consideration of an assessment for hereditary cancer. So you can learn more at hereditarycancerquiz.com. So looking at your screen today, um, that Q&A box at the top, that is where we will take questions. We will hold the questions until the end of the webinar. Questions can be for Lori or myself, and you can just type them in whenever you want during today's webinar, and we will address them at the end. You don't need to hold off. You're not going to interrupt us. Just go ahead and type them in. And then in the left-hand corner where it says technical issues, that's where you can chat. You can uh, you know, share comments if you want to make comments to share with the other participants. But you can also put in a technical question, for example, if you're having trouble with the sound or anything like that. Travis Bray is monitoring the uh, chat box, and he will respond to you there. So let's get started with my story and why we wanted to host this webinar and why we've had nutrition talks for other events that we've sponsored for families in our community. Um, this is Travis Bray with his granny. This is Travis when he was 15 years old. And Travis is a third generation um, family member with familial adenomatous polyposis, also known as FAP. And for those who are unfamiliar with that, it is a hereditary cancer syndrome that causes a 100% chance of colon cancer. The photo that you're looking at is Travis at 15 years old. You are now muted. Um, Travis was diagnosed as an infant with FAP because they knew to watch for it, but he did not have a colectomy and construction of the J-pouch until he was 15 years old. And as you can see, um, he was a tall, lanky boy at 15, but especially after having his surgery, um, as many people do, he lost a lot of weight. He then had a rectal tumor at age 22, which he had removed. And despite all of that, he has always been extremely active um, and had a relatively normal life. And prior to us making any dietary changes, um, Travis had the typical standard American diet, um, but he had a, a couple of things that he added. He added daily fiber supplements, so he was told by his doctor to drink um, like a metamucil type of product, and he drank that on a daily basis um, to add more fiber. And he also had regular hydration drinks um, as someone who is active. And then combined with the fact that he does not have a colon, he had to pay a lot of attention to hydration. So he drank hydration drinks regularly, kind of your typical Gatorade-type products. And he remembers having about 8 to 10 bowel movements a day. And... Um, Unusually foul smelling gas. 
And Travis said to me uh, that there's kind of a running joke in his family that you never had to ask, um, you know, who farted or who just went to the bathroom because um, in his family it was known that once you had the surgery, your um, gas or your bowel movement smelled um, extraordinarily different than the rest of the family. I have this picture here. This is our wedding photo. And the reason I have it there is to show you how thin he is. If you think back to that other photo here, um, looking at his face and then looking at him here, you can see he's lost a lot of weight. In 2011, um, which was prior to us start, starting the Hereditary Colon Cancer Foundation, Travis became pretty sick. Um, he was too weak to play sports. He had incredible brain fog um, to the extent where he had to take time off of work. Extreme fatigue at times. There were days, um, sometimes went on for many days, where he could not get off the couch. Um, after a lot of invasive tests, the only real diagnosis was that he was iron deficient. Um, he was B12 deficient, and he had hyperkalemia, which means he his electrolytes were off balance in his body, and he had a lot of potassium, a lot more potassium um, in proportion to the other electrolytes in his body. So all of those were causing his symptoms. They they found um, slight ulcers at the site of his anastomosis where from his surgery at 15, but they didn't think that was the cause of it. Um, all they knew is that he was it, uh, experiencing these symptoms that could be treated, which is what they did. So he, they did treat the the iron, B12, and potassium issue. At home, though, we made a lot of changes. Um, we did. An incredible amount of research. Um, it was a very scary time for us um, with the doctors not finding anything in him being too weak to go to work sometimes. We did a lot of research on our own and kind of gave our diet an overhaul and also tried to do our best to make sure he never ended up in that situation again. So we eliminated gluten from our diet. We increased protein. And then we added smoothies. So rather than the daily fiber supplements, we actually created a fiber-rich smoothie every day um, prior to that, Travis was unable to eat greens because they would cause blockages for him. But by adding the smoothies, he was able to get kale and iron or, and spinach into his diet. And those smoothies not only helped um, with the fiber, but they also increased his iron and other vitamins and minerals. We also added Floridix, um, which is a supplement. Um, you know, we're pretty natural around here, and we prefer, if we can, to get our nutrients from whole foods or from parts of foods rather than um, something that's highly processed or artificial. So he started taking Floridex to keep his iron up, and it also has a lot of other vitamins, including B vitamins in it. And then added VSL number three. And VSL number three is a probiotic. Um, you can get it over the counter, although it's held in the pharmacy in the refrigerator. And you can also get a prescription of VSL. And I want to say this probiotic was life-changing for us. Um, I, Lori can talk more to the, to the probiotic and, and maybe some of the differences if you have questions about probiotics. But I can say that this one is definitely formulated for people who have digestive disease, and it's really potent. Um, and it dramatically reduced Travis's bowel movements as well as the smell falling uh, flatulence. Um, and it, I believe it has really helped him absorb more nutrients as well because it slowed down his bowel movements that allowed for more time for his body to absorb all of the nutrients. So this one's a life changer. It is something that he continues to take daily. And it's expensive, though. Um, you know, if you buy it over the counter in most places in the U.S., it's almost two dollars a day, between a dollar fifty and two dollars a day. And if you get a prescription, you can get that cost reduced um, the, by, or by getting a prescription for the packets. It's a higher dosage, but you only have to take a portion of the packet to maintain. So, VSL number three, the company does offer um, hardship stipends on their website. So if you want the product but you're having financial trouble paying for it, there's a form you can fill out on your website. And we are not paid to promote Floridex or VSL number three. I just want to make that clear. We're just sharing with you what has worked in our family. 
So after all of that research, um, in 2012, I went back to school um, to study nutrition. And I learned a lot about inflammation-reducing diet. And with Travis, as well as all of us, even the general population, the more we can do to reduce inflammation in our bodies, the better our chances of decreasing cancer and other problems um, in our digestive system. So we reduce inflammation by reducing red meat, eliminating processed meats, and then dramatically reducing um, preservatives and additives. We also reduced processed foods um, and eliminated both soy and corn, which after keeping a food journal, we realized those were really um, affecting both of us, and so we eliminated those. And as I mentioned, as a result, Travis has less bowel movements, um, normal smelling bowel movements, and rarely nutrient deficient. Um, having said all that, <laughs> as we sit here today, um, Travis and I have both contracted a um, parasite from international travel, and so <laughs> we're not feeling very healthy, but for the most part, when, when we don't have uh, travel parasites, um, things are pretty great. Which leads me to Lori, well said. Um, we had the opportunity to first meet Lori in 2015 when we had a hereditary colon cancer family day in Chicago. And we thought it was really important to talk about nutrition at that meeting. And we were introduced uh, by Dr. Sonia Kupfer, who heads up the hereditary cancer unit at University of Chicago Medicine. We were introduced to Lori, and Lori sees and treats um, their patients with digestive diseases. Um, hereditary cancer, yes, but also um, for those of you who are on the phone with celiac and ulcerative colitis and um, another host, I saw many, many um, digestive diseases that were mentioned when people were registering, and that is Lori's specialty. So without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome Lori and appreciate her um, coming back to join us today. Okay, great. So hello, everybody. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, we will be talking about nutrition for altered bowels. So some of our goals today is to review some basic anatomy of the GI tract. We'll discuss some overall nutrition recommendations. And then the goal is really to help empower you and help you to use your diet to improve the nutrition and your overall quality of life. So what is diet and what is nutrition? So diet is the actual food that is consumed, so it's what you're eating. And nutrition is really the absorption of food and the nourishment to support life, so how you're breaking down food and how you eat. Now the GI tract is, um, is quite complicated. Um, as you know, it starts in your mouth. So there's salivary glands that help to start to break down some different foods. There's enzymes in, those, um, in your mouth that help to break down some foods. Um, then the food travels down your esophagus to your stomach. Now, if you think about your stomach, it, it basically has like a battery acid to it. So it really helps to mix the food that has a lot of gastric juices that start to really break down and pulverize the food. Then it travels down to the small intestine or the small bowel, which is about 20 to 21 feet long um, in most individuals. And in that area, um, the foods are um, broken down and they're mixed with the bile from um, the gallbladder and um, the pancreatic enzymes that are pushed out of the pancreas to really start helping you to absorb your foods. Um, there's a brush border along the small intestine. And so if you want to look up uh, what the brush border, it's also called villi. And it's a beautiful carpet of lining of little hairs that help you to absorb nutrients. Um, then it goes, your food goes down into the large um, intestine or the colon. Now that could be five to six, and some people it's up to seven feet long. And in that area is where the food, um, imagine it's almost like a sponge, where the fluid is kind of um, sucked out and the electrolytes are properly um, absorbed. Um, this is also where um, we have some salvaging of nutrient absorption, which we'll talk about on this next slide here. Um, so this, I utilize this slide to kind of break down each section um, that we just discussed. So like I said, the, the stomach really, um, that's where your water, alcohol, and, and a couple other nutrients, minerals are um, absorbed there. Your duodenum is that first part of your small intestine. Um, 
and that does have a lot of absorption of ca capacity. The jejunum is the middle part, and as you can see, there's a lot right there that gets absorbed. And then the ileum is right before the large intestine. And so oftentimes, if, if you have a colon resection, and if it's higher up, um, there might be an ileal resection there. And so as you can see, this is where um, B12 is, um, is absorbed, and often if patients have a resection in that area, it's almost as if they're vegan because the B12 is not going to be absorbed despite if they're eating a lot of animal products. Um, this is also where bile salts are reabsorbed. And then in the large intestine, as you can see, um, this is again where those electrolytes or your electricity in your body. So if you think about your sodium, your potassium, magnesium, and things like that, it's absorbed right there between the small intestine and the large intestine. Um, then also there's short chain fatty acids. And these are produced. Um, when the bacteria then the bacteria ferments fiber in your large intestine. Um, so there's a lot of different beneficial things of short chain fatty acids, which might be minimized, especially if there's a large colonic resection. So what is the purpose of the colon? So like I already mentioned, um, there's fluids, nutrients, and electrolytes that are absorbed in that area. Um, it ferments that soluble fiber, the foods that you're consuming that have fiber, which we'll go over in a bit. And also it helps to propel and form the stool. Now if you look at this picture here, um, when you're looking at the cecum, which is um, the first part of your um, large intestine, just below the ileum, so that little um, outlet that um, is open, that's the ileal area, the end of your small intestine. So if you were look, to look down at your body, that's on the right side of your body, near your right hip area. So that's where your large intestine starts. It comes up towards your um, Rib cage over to the left, down, and then um, towards the end there, you'll, and towards the end by your left hip is um, where the sigmoid colon and the rectum and all that starts really low. Um, so again, it really matters where your um, resection was at, um, which might change the types of bowel movements that you might have. Um, if you have a lot more resected, again, you're gonna, going to have a, a looser bowel movement oftentimes. Um, and if you had less and um, absorb, uh, less resected, you're likely going to have uh, more thicker bowel movements for most individuals. Hey, Lori, just so you know, we can see your mouse, and you're welcome to move it around to point to things if you like. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay, and then on this slide, um, many of you may have heard of the Bristol stool scale. Um, I think it's a very great tool to utilize, um, especially in my clinic, um, because sometimes patients don't always like to talk about their bowel movements. And it's, it's really good to really know how your bowel movements are. Um, again, if you think about um, the number four here, this is, you know, I have a smiley face there. That's when your bowel movements are like a smooth, like a sausage or snake, um, and softer. Now again, the, the looser bowel movements that are type seven, if you consider that, those, those bowel movements are going to be a very quick transit time. So um, they're going to likely happen pretty often, um, and there's not going to be much time between consuming the foods um, and having the bowel movements. Whereas the type 1, where they're going to be very, very hard um, little nuts, um, hard lumps, those are usually hard to pass for most individuals, and those are stool that has been sitting in the colon for a long time. Often, the harder the stool is, and, and even sometimes if it's a little soft, if you have inflammation, um, going on. Sometimes you might have, again, a little bit of blood. If it's a harder stool, um, you may also have, with regard to any of these stools, um, you might have a little bit of mucus. And the mucus is really at the end of your large and end of your um, rectum. That, that mucus layer is a protective layer. So it's not necessarily going to harm you if you have mucus in your stool. It's just that sometimes it's protecting you. So if you did have a harder stool, it's not going to rip that lining of your rectum. So some common foods that cause symptoms for individuals are often sometimes high fiber foods. So nuts, raw, leafy vegetables. Um, now as Shawnee and um, Travis have been doing um, for some years now, is you know, utilizing some things and maybe pulverizing them, adding them into smoothies, and we'll talk about some other different ideas as well. Maybe doing nut butter for, for some individuals versus just eating handfuls and handfuls of nuts. That may help with the um, 
the, the particle size of the fiber and may reduce the symptoms. So it's not saying you can, that you know, fiber is a bad thing, but sometimes excessive amounts may cause symptoms. High fat foods are often an issue for many individuals. Um, again, it may not be high fat foods like a, a little bit of avocado or fish, um, but it's often the things that are going to be greasy foods and fried foods. Um, those often cause issues for many individuals. Caffeine as well, many individuals may realize that if you're consuming a lot of caffeine, that's going to speed up the transit time for many individuals. It might cause more rumbling, gas, bloating um, because of um, the effect. So coffee, teas, sodas, and also chocolate, um, if you're having a large amount, may cause issues. Alcohol, many may realize if you have you know excessive amount of alcohol even a little bit it may cause some different GI issues um, dairy specifically lactose is going to be the issue for most individuals when it comes to dairy and spicy foods is often an, an issue for many people as well so fluids are very important for the GI tract and for your overall health so I recommend individuals, and this is again through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, um, about a half an ounce of fluid per pound. So if someone weighs 120 pounds, you want to aim for about 60 ounces a day um, of fluids. So again, soda, juices, um, Kool-Aid, which is consumed very often here, unfortunately, in the Chicagoland area, um, caffeinated drinks, these are not going to specifically hydrate an individual. Um, and the sugar, as well as the caffeine, they may add to cramping, bloating, diarrhea, and further weight loss, unintended weight loss for many individuals. So when it comes to fiber, there's two different types of fiber. There's insoluble fiber, and think of that as roughage. So again, this is, think of adding bulk to stool. So commonly, um, think of like celery, rhubarb, you know, the rhubarb, um, ends of asparagus where it's very um, high fiber and not the, the soft end at the top. And also apple skins, potato skins, um, soluble fiber. So again, most fruits and vegetables have a mixture of these. But soluble fiber, think of how oats look in water. So if you put some oats um, in water, it gets to be a very um, thick, kind of a goobery texture. Um, and it, this can help to slow the transit time and help with the slowing down the gastric emptying, especially if someone has looser bowel movements. Um, this can really help. So um, oftentimes, you know, bananas, we'll talk about some other different soluble fiber in a minute, oatmeal, applesauce versus someone just having um, a whole apple with the skin. Um, some patients can also just tolerate taking off the skin um, and just having an apple without the skin um, or doing the applesauce. And again, with regard to adding fiber, you don't want to go from having three or four grams of fiber in a day to upping it to 30 grams a day. That's not going to help your GI tract, and it's going to cause a lot of different GI symptoms. So again, this is absolutely not a complete list, but I wanted to give some, um, uh, some examples so you can see there's soluble fiber, predominant sources, and then there's insoluble fiber. Like I mentioned, um, it's not absolute. So many of these foods are going to have a little bit of both. So um, again, when someone's trying to increase some of the soluble fiber, thinking of some of those different foods on that list. Um, and that again, um, some of the benefits of soluble fiber actually is um, specifically um, you know, oatmeal, some of the flax seeds, and some things like um, that can help with your cholesterol. Um, definitely not just having French bread and rice per se, but some of the soluble fibers can really help to lower cholesterol. That's one of the other benefits of that um, texture of that soluble fiber. And then the insoluble fiber, again, if someone's having very, very loose bowel movements, it's not saying that they cannot eat any of these, but it's great to reflect on the current diet and say, okay, am I just having uh, a salad that's humongous every single day with all raw foods and saying, okay, maybe incorporating some other things into that salad, maybe it being a scoop of quinoa or other things, maybe having, having part of it, you know, um, some roasted carrots or other things you can throw into that salad um, instead of just having a lot of insoluble fibers. And incorporating fibers. So like I already mentioned, 
you want to sometimes, again, if you have a, a faster transit time, is break up and manipulate the fiber in some of those fruits and vegetables. So that can include peeling, chopping, cooking, or even pureeing the foods. Um, making a smoothie like I'm, we just were talking about earlier, um, stir frying the vegetables with rice, um, cooking into a pasta sauce. So again, um, oftentimes I'll even recommend to patients who don't like vegetables is maybe cooking some vegetables and throwing them into a food processor or a blender and, and blending that into that pasta sauce. And, and maybe if family members don't like the vegetables or other things, that's a good way for them to kind of tuck in that fiber into the, uh, the pasta sauce. Um, again, fresh fruit. In, in a smoothie is a great way to incorporate the fiber and not have to feel that you have to have a fiber supplement per se. Um, and then again, blending vegetables into soups or just having, you know, soups with vegetables in there that are well cooked. Um, beans and lentils are an absolutely great source of fiber, um, but sometimes if individuals are having a lot of gas and bloating, um, they may not be able to tolerate large amounts. So typically I'd recommend, again, breaking that fiber up and again, watching the portions. So um, sometimes cooking and blending them into sauces, making little dips, the soups, and making spreads out of them. Um, and then nuts. So as I already mentioned, sometimes having large portions of nuts may set off the GI tract. Um, but whether you can grind them into different products like breads or cakes, um, or use it, utilizing nut butters. So um, often peanut butter was popular for many years, but now we're looking towards a lot of other ones, almond, cashew butter, sunflower seed butter, um, there's pumpkin seed butter, there's a lot of different ones that people can utilize, especially if there are nut allergies um, in a family situation. So you can still get the benefits of the healthy fats and some of the fiber and as well as protein. So I'm just going to touch on FODMAPs because oftentimes um, individuals may come into my clinic and they uh, may read online, they feel like they have to be on a very strict low FODMAP diet. Um, I just wanted to touch on some of the reasons why um, some of these foods may cause um, issues in some individuals. So this was developed um, back in 2001 by Sue Shepard, um, who is a dietitian in Australia. And they found in their um, research that certain carbohydrates are poorly absorbed in the small intestine. The first one they really found was fructose. And they found that these, these carbohydrates, they were rapidly fermented by bacteria in the large intestine. So they would go through that small intestine and not get broken down, or I'm sorry, absorbed, like they normally would. And then when they would get to that large intestine, it would be like a beer brewery where this carbohydrates would be fermenting and causing gas and bloating and loose bowel movements. So for hundreds of years now, people know about lactose intolerance. So someone might say, oh my gosh, I have a glass of milk and you know, I automatically have gas, bloating, loose stools. So that's a very common, well-known FODMAP. And again, to, to kind of back up, FODMAP is, is an acronym. Um, and bear with me, it stands for fermentable, um, this is types of carbohydrates, oligo, dye, monosaccharides, and polyols. So these are all different types of carbohydrates. Um, and if you look this up, there are a lot of different resources online. Um, the Monash University in Australia has an excellent app um, for the smartphones um, and website that has a lot of good breakdown of the foods. Fructose, as you may imagine, this is going to be in some fruits, but it's really in, in, in a lot of sodas. So high fructose corn syrup, candies, this may cause a lot of gas and bloating. Um, fructans, interestingly so, this is where wheat, rye, and barley, so this is also those gluten-containing grains. So often people may say, I went on a gluten free diet and I felt a little better and this might just because, uh, be because of the fact that those grains are fermentable and they may cause gas and bloating and they may not have celiac disease or have an issue with the gluten. It's more of the carbohydrates in those grains. Um, polyols, these are often in sugar-free products. So, um, uh, so things that you might find that are sugar-free, anything that ends in an OL, sorbitol, xylitol, mannitol, um, you can find those, and those can definitely cause issues in, with the GI tract. And then lastly, galactins um, can definitely cause gas and bloating, which are 
mostly consists cons um, consisting of beans. So if you think of in the morning, sometimes people wake up and they have no gas and bloating. And sometimes just one thing can drop into the bucket and cause it to overfill, like lactose. For other people, it could be the variety of foods they eat throughout the day that causes this bucket to overfill and cause gas and bloating. And typically, again, I don't recommend someone try this diet for an extremely long period of time. Um, you would just want to try it for a short period of time to see if you have any kind of benefit and then get back on a, a normal diet as much as possible. Um, there's been some recent research in the past couple of years now that, that has actually been found, uh, been studied in IBD, inflammatory bowel disease with Crohn's and colitis, and they found that if someone was on this diet for too long, it can decrease the good bacteria in the gut. And so we don't want that to happen because um, that you want to have a good amount of the healthy bacteria in the large intestine. So I just wanted to touch on the fact that these, these types of carbohydrates um, at the top that were already discussed can cause different kinds of physiological effects. So it can cause an uh, increase um, in water delivery into the intestine. And like we talked about, this already can cause more gas and bloating and distension. So um, the bowel movements can be quicker. You can have the bloating, abdominal pain, and then wind, other otherwise known as gas. So this is a very, um, a, a very newer diet overall compared to others, but um, you know, a lot of patients are interested in it. I think it's worthwhile, especially if someone's having a lot of GI symptoms to, to touch on, but not feel this is a, a lifelong um, thing. So I just wanted to touch on um, different types of fiber. So as Shawnee mentioned, I really do push having more natural fibers through fruits, vegetables, um, and incorporating those as much as possible. Um, because if you list, look at this list here, there are a variety of different kinds of these supplements. But the problem is, um, there's sometimes a mixture of the soluble fiber and the insoluble fiber. Um, but the side effects of, of them are having, you know, more gas, more bloating, um, abdominal pain. And so, un unfortunately, some of them also, the formulations of them that might have gummies and things like that, that might, might cause more of the gas and bloating due to the FODMAPs. So I just wanted to touch on um, the, the different types of uh, the fiber supplements. It's not saying, you know, that you should not do these. Some people definitely benefit from um, taking some of these different various supplements. But I think it's great to really look at your normal diet and see how you can incorporate fiber first versus only relying on a fiber supplement. So what can help slow the transit time? So again, making sure that you're eating slowly and chewing your foods thoroughly. So chewing your foods very, very well and making sure that you're sitting and eating in a calm manner as well. So you're not just inhaling your food while you're doing a million things at once. Um, again, trying to eat some foods with soluble fiber at each of your meals. So this can, we already mentioned that it can help slow that stomach, the gastric emptying and helps absorb those extra fluids. Um, again, the BRAT diet has been looked at. Um, it's a very old um, school kind of thought. Um, but, you know, this would include bananas, rice, applesauce, toast. And so doing things that are very, very bland for a period of time, especially if someone's having extremely high um, output if they have an ostomy or very, very loose bowel movements. So doing some formulation uh, similar to that, whether it be gluten-free toast or doing white rice. Um, and then the low FODMAP diet, we already discussed some of that. Um, I think, you know, it's not saying that someone has to be on a strict diet, but I think when I look over someone's diet, if they're drinking five regular sodas a day that has high fructose corn syrup, I'd say cut this out, see if this helps you, rather than starting this very restricted diet. If they're drinking five cups of milk a day and don't think that bothers them, I'd say let's try lactose-free milk or let's tr cut that out. Um, and then again, the sugar alcohols. People don't realize how these are in so many different foods, um, such as sugar-free gum. So I've had many patients, their main issue is the sugar-free gum. They're eating a pack of a day. And so they cut that out and they feel much better. So I just wanted to touch on some tips for those who have an ostomy. Um, again, I would recommend small frequent meals, um, drinking small amounts of liquids with meals, so only having two to three ounces and not um, having large gulps with meals because this may speed the transit time um, and dilute the food so it won't get absorbed properly. Um, and then sipping on most fluids between the meals. 
um, avoiding those sweet, simple sugars in foods because of the increased uh, transit time. Also, salting the food liberally, um, and this seems contraindicated for some that say, why would you want me to salt my food? Why would you want me to have these um, higher salt, higher potassium foods? And this is because without having a colon, again, you don't have that ability um, to use that sponge that the large intestine has, and you're ha you likely will be low in some of your electrolytes. Um, and then resting after the meal so that um, this can help with absorption. This is just a, a quick tool to utilize for um, nutritional considerations for those with ostomy. So um, some gas producing foods. So again, some people will be consuming a lot of these foods and, and they don't realize that they could be gas producing. It's not saying to not have these foods, but it's saying, okay, maybe minimizing the amount that you're having or only having one or two of those a day so that not every meal has five you know, options that are high gas producing. Um, odor producing, again, if someone's complaining about um, um, strong odor, some of those can cause um, issues with odor, um, some different things that can help with controlling the odor. Um, so again, patients utilize some of these to really help, um, whether it's peppermint oil, cranberry juice, buttermilk, some of those probiotics. Um, even just taking a probiotic can also help. Um, and then some different things that could cause obstructions. Um, and again, this is across the board if someone had um, Crohn's disease where they're likely to obstruct um, and have strictures where their intestines get smaller. Um, and then those, again, with ostomies. Um, if they also have a lower ostomy, the, the bowel movements, the output would be very thick. So watching out for things that could cause obstructions and get stuck in that area. And then things that can help to thicken stool. Um, so we looked at some of these already, but just again for a reference. Um, I wanted to touch on some um, oral rehydration solutions. Um, I do recommend trying to make your own. Again, the first one that's on here does have a, a regular Gatorade for those that um, wouldn't want to make their own, that can just dilute something. Um, but then again, utilizing whether it be um, juices or a tomato, uh, whether it be fruit juice with water and salt or tomato juice. Um, a lot of my patients also really like using broths that they can add things to. Um, and there are a lot of bone broths that are out now um, that are particularly high in um, potassium and some of the other things. Um, it might not be very high in salt, so they can add some salt to that and some water and help that and utilize that for a rehydration solution. Again, this is mostly for patients who have had a large resection in their colon um, or who are quite active and have been um, found to be dehydrated multiple times um, and had to be hospitalized for dehydration. There are a couple formulations. Um, Ceralite is one that they use here in our hospital at University of Chicago. Um, drip drop is something that you can find over the counter. Um, some individuals don't like it though because it does contain sucralose or Splenda. Um, so again, maybe trying to make your own. There are a variety of other ones that you can find online as well. Um, I wanted to touch on in importance of considering food journals, not lifelong, but this can really help for a short period of time to help you know, aid in your mindfulness of what you're consuming, to help you to track the symptoms to see if you could find any sort of correlation between the foods that you're eating and your current GI symptoms, and just remembering that not everyone is affected by the same foods. And typically what I recommend is just including the foods that you're consuming, the portions that you're having, and then the symptoms that you're having before and after the meal. So again, remembering that if you're highly stressed before eating a typical meal that you would eat without issues, remembering that, that you may have abdominal pain, you may have a more frequent bowel movement because of this whole brain-gut axis, which I don't have time to talk about, um, but there's a lot of nerves that are involved in your GI tract that can really um, cause GI issues without even eating any food. So um, I just wanted to lastly touch on some of the optimal um, diet recommendations. So again, carbohydrates are your friend, especially if you're um, if you're an active person as well, you need to have some sort of carbohydrates in the diet. So whether it come from vegetables, if you are, um, some people are paleo and they're grain free, but trying to get it through other um, sources, whether it be your fruits and vegetables, um, your beans, lentils, yogurt, kefir, um, healthy fats. Again, there's a variety of healthy fats with different oils. Um, also getting your fats through nuts and seeds, fish as well. Um, again, fish goes across the board between fats and protein. Um, 
Again, I do recommend limiting the amount of red meats and avoiding uh, processed meats as much as possible um, because, again, this is not going to be beneficial for the colon health. Um, aiming for more um, eggs, fish, poultry, beans, lentils, and nuts for the sources of protein. And then really trying to aim for all the colors of the rainbow when it comes to your diet. So again, there's phytochemicals or phytonutrients in all the different fruits and vegetables. So, and they're, they're varying in the different colors of your fruits and vegetables. So um, really trying to look at your diet every day. I mean, I try to, again, I'm a dietitian, so I may be a little different, but I really try to get a lot of different colors throughout the day so that when I look at my day that I've had a variety of things rather than only having one or two colors throughout the day. Um, so again, that's going to give you a lot more benefits um, overall. And I did wanted to touch on um, the VSL-3 is an excellent probiotic that Shawnee also mentioned, and that's great that Travis has found a lot of benefits from it. And really, it's 10 times more potent than the average probiotic. Um, there's been many studies on it, reviews as well, over 170. It's been really used in ulcerative colitis, those with ileal pouches where your um, large intestine is um, removed and your ileum is pulled down to your uh, to your rectum. And so that's been the, the bulk of the studies have been with those with ileal pouches who have pouchitis, IBS, and pediatrics. The thing is it does need to be refrigerated, and some individuals don't realize this and will go periods of time and not and traveling and things and not know they need to refrigerate it. Um, it does have a lot of different strains of probiotics, and so again, this is um, very beneficial because it gives a wide range of probiotics that can help. Um, I've tried many over the years of different probiotics, and again, sometimes your body won't react to certain um, genus and species. So again, the genus would be like the bifido or the lactobacillus. The species would be the acidophilus or the bifido longum. Um, that's how the probiotics are broken up. Um, and then the Floridix is another thing that we do recommend for a lot of our patients, especially those that can't tolerate oral iron. And it's an, a great formulation because it not only does it have um, iron, and it's an iron, it's a ferrous gluconate, which is usually well absorbed and well tolerated without GI issues. It also has a B12 um, as Shawnee mentioned, and it's uh, very well absorbed. Um, and it's, it's great for those who have low B12 levels um, and have had resections, ileal resections or colonic resections. Um, and so that's it for today. Um, I just wanted to make sure that some of the goals were reached, that we wanted to increase your knowledge of the GI anatomy, um, provide you with some helpful tools to better manage your diet, and help you to feel empowered so that you could utilize nutrition to utilize your diet to improve your overall nutrition status. And really my goal is always to increase someone's quality of life um, because life is too short and we don't want you to have such a very restricted diet. You want to have the most varied diet as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, yes. I want to remind people, and go ahead and keep your PowerPoint open uh, okay. because you might be turning to it. I'm going to leave the screen on you in case for questions okay. you might want to read the, the slides. Um, and I want to remind everyone in the top left-hand corner, there is a Q&A button. Go ahead and click on that Q&A button um, and submit your questions. And those questions can be for Lori, they can be for me, and they can also be for Travis. So we're all three here to answer any questions you have. So go ahead and start typing in that Q&A box. And in the meantime, while people are populating that question box, um, Lori, I have a couple of things. One with the VSL, um, we do travel a ton. And um, Travis went onto the VSL website and found out that you can technically leave it out of the refrigerator for a week as long as it doesn't get hot or, you know, like oh. above a normal temperature. But we personally, just to try and keep all those good bacteria alive, we try not to have it be out of the refrigerator for 48 hours, you know. But, um, oh, interesting, yeah. But anyway, yes. Yeah, so oh, that's cool. I didn't realize that. Yeah, as much as possible. Um, I know because, you know, it's, expensive and it's yes. so important in our life that we don't, you know, we want it to be functional when we get to where we're going. So well, yes. before this, uh, carry a bunch of it with you and then leave it in a hotel uh, refrigerator or in a friend's boat in Amsterdam. That doesn't help you out. That's just a lot of money wasted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> experience. Um, and then also, if you could go back to that slide, I think it was slide 18 where you had that wonderful chart um, for everyone and the last column was um, to thicken stool, yes. 
Okay. And you, where your mouse was, it was hiding the, the PB. So I wanted to make sure everyone knew that that's a creamy peanut butter. Oh, yeah. Um, Sorry, creamy peanut butter. Yes. Yeah. Or any nut yeah. butter. <laughs> yeah, okay. So any nut butter. Great. I wanted to make sure that that was in the recording so people knew because that's a really um, common one for, for us. We eat a lot of nut butter in this house. Yes. Um, okay. So let me uh, jump over to some questions here. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And the first one is from Travis. He says, if he takes B12 oral supplements that dissolve under the tongue, am I absorbing it appropriately? Yes. So um, they have done some studies in that. That is the way you take It's a sublingual. Um, that's the name of it when you take your B12 underneath your tongue. And so that is pretty well absorbed. Um, and especially compared to taking just a pill that would go through the GI tract, um, the sublingual um, absorbed that way underneath the tongue is going to be really well absorbed. Um, I'm actually doing some research for IBD. I'm doing a couple talks this month. And so that can basically be pretty comparable to taking B12 shots once a month. Um, but I would still recommend doing the B12 sublingual, trying to do it every day if possible um, for those that are low in B12, just to make sure the absorption, that you're getting enough throughout the month. That's great because he used to get the monthly injections of B12 and so um, but prefers to do the sublingual tablets. So that's yes. great. Actually, I prefer to do, uh, I prefer to do the, the, the B12 shot. Those have the most clear effect. The big first? Yes. Yeah. yeah I, I, if, I, if I had the choice, um, I would rather do monthly B12 shots. Like there's yes. no question about how much you're getting. It's going straight into the muscles, going straight into the blood. Yeah, um, I don't forget. You know, I don't forget about it. Like it's, you know, I I have enough stuff between Floridex and and, and probiotics and and various other things that I take, and uh, yeah, it gets a little bit old. So like getting a prescription yeah. of monthly B12 injections is really nice. You just like pop it on the first, roll with it for 30 days, come back to it. But it does require a prescription. So and it requires yeah. you to be able to give yourself an injection or have somebody in your household give you an injection every month. Yeah. For anyone on the line, injection is super easy. It's not hard. Oh, that's good. Yeah, right. I've never done it, but yeah, I know a lot of people, you know, and that is, and so I would say if you're not sure how your B12 is, maybe getting it rechecked with your physician just to make sure it's in a good level for you. All right. The next question comes from Lori, and she says, I've had really bad acid reflux, and I'm taking Nexium after trying four other medications. But even water can cause me to have heartburn on an empty stomach. My GI doctor finally thinks that maybe it's caused by all the polyps in my stomach. Any thoughts on that? The polyps in her stomach? Um, mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, it could be due to the polyps in the stomach that could be causing it. And then I would say maybe making sure to have a little bite of something before having a large amount of water. Um, I do have other patients that claim that just having water can really exacerbate their their heartburn. Um, and so again, unfortunately, there's no big research studies with regard to nutrition and heartburn because um, there's just not much um, funding for that versus medications. Um, so I'm sorry I don't have a better answer, but I would say um, it could be the polyps in the stomach um, that could be exacerbating that. Um, and maybe trying to include some soluble fiber um, in the diet to see if that would help. Um, maybe having a little bit of that before having a large amount of water. And what about um, apple cider vinegar? I know some naturopaths recommend taking apple cider vinegar for acid reflux, but I'm not sure how that, um, you know, how that uh, affects somebody who has polyps in their stomach. Yes. Yeah, so, and again, that's the challenge too. Is there's no like, you know, randomized controlled studies with, you know, apple cider vinegar and polyps per se. Um, but I do have some patients that um, that swear by taking their um, raw apple cider vinegar. Um, again, making sure that you're not just taking it by itself and you're mixing it with some water um, because it's so it's so potent that you wouldn't just want to take a shot of it by itself. So making sure that you mix it with a good amount of water. Um, there's a recipes that are on the side of um, um, the bottle. I do recommend if you did it, um, again, I'm not getting money from this or anything, but Bragg's apple cider vinegar. It's a raw apple cider vinegar and it does have probiotics. It has the mother in there. Um, and so she does have some different recipes on her website. Um, and so that could be beneficial, again, um, from the probiotic effect of it. Um, it seems acidic, um, but it can actually help with the, the flora um, of the esophagus and the um, stomach. 
Okay, and I believe the recommended dosage is a half a teaspoon to a full teaspoon diluted in water. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, and then Rosemary, her question is, I've been told that white flour products like pasta and white rice increase inflammation. What are your thoughts? Yes, so um, I agree that you don't want to do excessive amount of those um, of those foods. Um, and so, yes, if you're doing a lot of white foods, I was just going over this with someone with fatty liver today, you know, that's going to be a little bit more inflammatory overall if so that's all you're doing. So sometimes if, if someone's having a lot of loose bowel movements, I'd say, okay, maybe doing a little bit of, um, you know, maybe mixing white rice with brown rice or trying with starting with maybe a white quinoa. Um, quinoa is more of a um, whole grain, and that will have more benefits versus just having white rice per se. Um, and with regard to including any of those kind of grains, certainly some people feel better without them. Um, I'm not necessarily recommending to have boatloads of just white pasta and white rice per se. It's just giving a recommendation of that it is a soluble, um, it can help to slow down output with ostomies. Um, but yes, I think with any kind of diet, try not to focus on having only those kind of products. So incorporating whole grains as much as possible, whether it be oat flour, quinoa flour, um, things like that, that can help to give you a little bit more benefit than just the white foods. Okay. Thank you for that. And the next question, I'm going back to the stool chart that you showed us. Oh, yes. Okay. We could bring that back up. Okay. And this question is from Travis. Um, is there a stool chart for people who do not have a colon? When my stool has what I consider good consistency, it doesn't look like any of these. Exactly. So that is a very good question. Um, as far as I know, there's not, but that would be a really good thing to develop um, because, yeah, this doesn't go across the board um, for those without um, their entire colon. Um, so I'll look into that to see. Um, and that's the thing. So a lot of times, too, if, if, if you're missing a, a good amount of the colon, sometimes if someone's having stools that are, you know, f you know five and six or six and seven, that's going to be your norm um, for some individuals. Um, and trying to, you know, thicken it up a little bit as much as possible, but um, that might be their norm. Again, if someone has, you know, an ileal pouch or, um, or an ostomy, per se. So, um uh, I think most people know my background is chemistry. Um, I can't help but like take data on myself quite a bit. Yes. And so I actually kind of developed my own chart. Uh, oh, cool. um, because, and uh, hopefully this doesn't get too graphic, but everyone in here doesn't have a colon. And hey, it doesn't yes. so partial. Yeah. All kind of partial. So like, the way that I do it is, you know, I have to like, you know, the best I'm going to get is soft serve ice cream. And yes. then the worst one to get is water. And then there's like uh, gradations in there and then kind of a stratified, like kind of in a mix with that is how much uh, undigested food I have. And so whenever yes. I take a data measurement, um, looking at, you know, trying to uh, cor uh, uh, see how my bowel response corresponds to what I'm eating, uh, I have this like metric for um, you know, like the consistency, but also the presence of uh, uh, food uh, particles. And then typically for me, I have a, like, I have a mixture of like good plus moist or diarrhea. And there's always like a mixture in there. So like I have this like yes. my own little, I guess it's about five stage uh, uh, chart. Or, 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 or levels uh, ranging from good to bad through there, um, including food, uh, presence of food in there, that helps me to understand how my bowel and how my pouch, my pouch is uh, operating. Yes. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that'd be. You should. Do you have that? Like, did you make the chart like official or anything? Um, no. It's. Uh, it, okay, it's. Uh, I don't have any pictures with it because. That would be weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny. But yeah, no, but I, that's great because I think that's... The, 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 yeah. the descriptions are kind of enough, you know? Like yeah, exactly. I'll, 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 have like, I'll have like solid and then I'll have like mixed solid, which means that like there's like solid with a little bit of diarrhea. Or I'll have like truly mixed, which is like an even mix, or mixed liquid, or mixed diarrhea or diarrhea. Um, yeah. And then I kind of like add into that, um, you know, undigested food. And I did like this three-stage food, uh, undigested food rating system because like, 
maybe I'll get like mushrooms that come through because that's just normal, but sometimes I'll get yeah. like a lot of undigested food. So I kind of rate kind of like a prime, double prime, triple prime to the to the chart as to whether it's uh, a little bit of food, so, uh, no food, or a little bit of food, more food, or a lot of food, basically. And Heather, before we go on to the next question, can you just address, um, you know, when people are seeing undigested food in their stool, um, can you talk a little bit about what that means? And then we have two other questions. Yes. So, yeah, when there is undigested food, that could be, again, because of the transit time. Certain things are never going to break down. So, like, mushrooms, um, corn, um, so those will never change shape. Um, so that's going to be normal to always see that into this, in the stool for most individuals. Um, but if you do see a lot of undigested food in, in your bowel movements, then I would say definitely trying to make sure you're not chugging too much liquid with your meals because that really pushes food through. And then to chew, chew, chew your food very, very well. Um, for some individuals, maybe to, to turn to more cooked foods or blending foods, like making smoothies, and see if that helps to minimize that amount, and then kind of reintroducing things back. And it might be stating the obvious here, but when you're passing through a food that is whole, you know, when you see it in its whole form, that, that means that you're not absorbing many of the nutrients from the food, Exactly. Correct? Yes, okay. absolutely. Um, and that's a good thing to always look. Yeah, um, people commented on this conversation. Um, uh, Dala says that she would love to see a stool chart <laughs> for no call, and she got a yeah. question of IRA in 2015, and if we develop this, she'd love to see it. And then Lori also added to Travis, for your chart, you should have oatmeal as one of your, your, Ooh, your yes. uh, descriptions. The <laughs> gradient. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then we have a question that was sent to me prior to today's discussion, and that was for a parent. Um, whose daughter had her uh, colectomy uh, just last year, and I believe she was 12. And she is not showing any difficult symptoms at all. She hasn't, trouble, hasn't had any trouble eating at all um, or difficulty with bowel movements. And things are going really great. But mom's wondering if there are things that they should be doing proactively from a nutrition standpoint, um, you know, just to prepare for what life might be like with her J-pouch. Ooh, um, that's a very good question. So maybe um, they can even always check to make sure um, that she doesn't have like low B12. Because um, again, when you're so young at that age, you might not even notice if your B12 is low because you're so high energy. Um, okay. So maybe just checking B12 to make sure the B12 is in the normal range. Um, checking vitamin D, which could sometimes be in the low range. Um, but I think if she's feeling really good, I think that's, that's excellent. Um, they could consider too um, to maybe have in the back burner is considering the VSL number three because if um, if the pouch does come become um, infected or not um, inflamed at any time with the pouchitis, that could be a great thing to have up their sleeve to incorporate that in the in the diet. But you know that's great that she can have an overall varied diet, no trouble eating, no trouble with um, her bowel movements and whatnot. So I think that's great. Okay, and then our last question here is from Yazid. Um, and I believe his son had his colectomy around 14. And the question is, um, his son is always suffering from bloating and diarrhea and abdominal pain and um, irritation around the anal opening. So it sounds like um, he's wondering if, you know, it sounds like he's being seen by a, I know he's being seen by a GI, but are there other, you know, is this something that meeting with a dietitian might be able to help? Yes, so I think definitely meeting with a dietitian would be a great idea where they can really go through the diet um, in depth and making sure, you know, it could be some simple things that they, that um, the child might be consuming that could be very gas producing. Um, maybe considering, so this is a, a colectomy or a J-pouch? I, I don't remember Okay. Um, what, I, I know it's a colectomy, and I don't remember what stage yes, three. Yeah, it was pulled down. Okay, so um, maybe even considering um, a try, doing a trial of a probiotic um, to see if that would help. Um, it could be some bacterial overgrowth um, that sometimes happens, with cause, which causes a lot of the gas and the bloating. So I think, yeah, definitely meeting with a dietitian um, just to review the diet could be definitely beneficial. Wonderful. 
Well, perfect timing. That was our last question that came in, and we were at the top of the hour. So thank you so much, Lori, for joining us again. And you know, we had 109 people register for today's discussion, wow. and then we will be posting it on our website on Friday so that others, um, you know, hopefully hundreds and even thousands of others can learn from your presentation today. So thank you for your time. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. Happy to be here. Okay, have a good evening. Thank you, too. Bye-bye, everyone. All right. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye.